Hello, let's talk about megaloblastic anemia. A patient, 37 year old man presents with a lifelong history of a seizure disorder managed since age two. You're playing the neurologist in this scenario. Your patient complains of fatigue, dyspnea on exertion and lightheadedness. Because those are classic anemia symptoms, you work up an anemia. You find that the hematocrit is low, hemoglobin is low, confirming the anemia. And you get a mean corpuscular volume that demonstrates macrocytosis at 130 femtoliters. Peripheral smear confirms macrocytosis and hypersegmented neutrophils, the hallmark of megaloblastic anemia, are also visualized on the smear. So because it's a macrocytic anemia, you take serum B9 and B12, and both of those are low. So you diagnose a folate deficiency related to the phenytoin or carbamazepine that this patient has been on for an extended period of time. And you replace the folate that this patient is lacking and the anemia goes away. So that's a micro macrocytic anemia. Macrocytic just meaning large cells. It's also a megaloblastic anemia. And when you think about macrocytic anemia, you can have big cells that are or are not megaloblastic. Megaloblastic means there's a big nucleus to cytoplasm ratio. So the nucleus of the cell is enlarged relative to how it normally is. Why would the nucleus of a cell be big? And we can answer that question by going back to reticulocyte development, red cell development. Understand that when we're looking at the evolution of a red cell, it starts off with a very large nucleus that gradually condenses and shrinks before getting expulsed from the cell cytoplasm, leaving you at the end of all that with an erythrocyte, a healthy, mature red blood cell. So by that alone, we can infer that as the nucleus of a cell matures, it shrinks. So the underlying pathology in B9 and B12 deficiency is an inability to make DNA. If a cell has trouble making DNA, it's going to have a larger nucleus because that nucleus is going to be immature. It's not going to be able to condense as it properly should because there won't be enough DNA to tick certain checkpoints that get that condensation going. So that's the reason for the large nucleus in a megaloblastic anemia. Now it all goes back to B9 and B12. This is a good point to dive into the biochemistry. This is uh, sort of the grounds or the territory that we are in right now. Uh, pyrimidine and purine synthesis, this page out of first aid. And we are particularly interested with the production of deoxythymidine monophosphate from deoxyuridine monophosphate. That's the DUMP to DTMP conversion. It's a simple methylation via the enzyme thymidylate synthase. Now this enzyme requires a folate cofactor to accomplish the methyl transfer. And obviously, U is an RNA base. T is the DNA equivalent of that RNA U. So if you don't have deoxythymidine monophosphate, you're not making DNA. Therefore, if you need B9 to make T to make DNA, that explains why you've got a megaloblastic anemia in the setting of B9 deficiency. And same thing with B12. As it turns out, this tetrahydrofolate that you need to make DNA gets replenished and recycled by the actions of cobalamin, and that's vitamin B12. So if you don't have B12, you won't have B9, you won't have DNA. Hence, the very similar presentation of the megaloblastic anemia in both B9 and B12 deficiencies. Now, B12 is also involved in a couple of other things besides just replenishing folate. Folate is folate, and that's about the extent of its importance in regards to anemia. But B12, because it does other things, we diagnose the patient 
based off of the different things that B12 does that B9 doesn't. So B12 participates, for example, skipping ahead a little bit, in odd chain fatty acid breakdown. And that is what leads to dorsal column demyelination in B12 deficiency, but again, not in B9 deficiency. So right off the bat, a big differentiating symptom is going to be that neurologic exam. Does the patient have symptoms of uh, subacute combined degeneration like loss of proprioception, ataxia, upper motor neuron signs, spasticity, and Babinski's? Those are all characteristic of B12 deficiencies, but not in B9. Now, from a laboratory standpoint, we can go back to this good flow chart showing you the B9, B12 interaction in B9 right here. It's just tetrahydrofolate getting methylated, then demethylated and remethylated over and over again. And B12 is helping out with that. But to replenish B12, B12 picks up the methyl group from folate and gives it to homocysteine to create methionine which is the methylating amino acid. If you need a methyl transfer, methionine is your guy. And it's really convenient. They both start with methyl. So there we go. Therefore, if you have a B12 or a B9 deficiency, both of those are characterized by an elevated blood homocysteine concentration. And staying on target, the way to tell a B12 from a B9 deficiency is just one extra test, and that's your blood methylmalonyl-CoA concentration, because B9 does not participate in anything having to do with methylmalonyl-CoA. So lab work, you can just get B9, B12, you know, you can just draw those blood labs, but on a test question, they're going to give you homocysteine and methylmalonyl-CoA. So the big point for you to remember is that methylmalonyl-CoA is elevated in B12 deficiency, but not in B9 deficiency. And in both of them, serum homocysteine is up. So that's it. Now let's get a little bit more into the weeds here. Homocysteine is a bad dude to have floating around your circulation. It antagonizes endothelial cells by creating lots of superoxide radicals. It's atherogenic and it's prothrombotic when endothelium gets a little agitated. It kind of shrinks back and makes some tissue factor as well as exposes some collagen that platelets can bind to on that basement membrane, which is just type four collagen supporting the vasculature. So the more homocysteine that you have in your circulation, the more endothelial damage is going around diffusely all over the body. And this culminates uh, in the worst case as an acute MI. So that's why homocysteine is uh, part of cardiology labs uh, for some specialists because they want to know, they want to know the degree of the activity of this aggravating compound in the blood. Getting back to B12, this is a really important concept here. And uh, we're looking here at odd chain fatty acid degeneration. This is a big, important takeaway. You want to know that B12 participates in the breakdown of odd chain fatty acids. So even chain fatty acids, I'll go through the same thing. Odd chain fatty acids, if it, if it has 13 or 17 carbons, what happens is that we chew it up and at the end of it, we're left with propionyl CoA. That's got three carbons in a CoA. That's not acetyl CoA, which has two carbons in a CoA, and it can go straight into the Krebs cycle. And we have no problems breaking that down because again, it's a Krebs, it's a TCA cycle substrate. But propionyl CoA, we have to metabolize that with a couple of extra steps to get it to slot into the Krebs cycle. So in order to do that, we use biotin to make methylmalonyl CoA and then we use B12 to make succinyl-CoA. Now, if we don't have B12 
propionyl CoA, which is just three carbons and a CoA, builds up inside cells that make a lot of propionyl CoA. And it it's an acid. It'll be propionic acid. And that's going to be an acidosis locally, which is going to be toxic to the cells that are accumulating this metabolite. So what cells make a lot of propionyl CoA? So to answer that, you could just ask what cells have to break down a lot of odd chain fatty acids and one cell type of the body that does the most fatty acid metabolism is the Schwann cell or the oligodendrocyte in the central nervous system. Those are cells that make lots of myelin. In fact, they're just about nothing but myelin. And remember, they wrap around neurons and circle them many, many times over. So there's a ton of lipids inside these Schwann cells and oligodendrocytes. And because you're constantly repleting and upkeeping your membrane, you're constantly having to break down odd chain fatty acids. So if you don't have the B12 to do that, the very first cell type in the body that would be affected is going to be the Schwann cell, which is why B12 deficiency presents with this elevated methylmalonyl-CoA in the blood, but more importantly, with signs and symptoms of upper motor neuron lesions due to this lateral column demyelination, as well as proprioceptive and vibratory sensational defects due to demyelination of the dorsal columns. So that's B12 deficiency. No other vitamin is going to present like this. And again, that's really going to help you differentiate B12, B9, the presence of those symptoms on neurologic exam. Back to the SDL, megaloblastic anemia is caused by B12 or folate deficiency and is characterized on peripheral smear by macroovalocytes, that just means large oval red blood cells, and hypersegmented neutrophils, which are absent in any other type of anemia. So the hypersegmented neutrophil, you ought to be like Pavlov's dog. As soon as you see that, you say, oh, it's a megaloblastic vitamin deficiency anemia. This paragraph laying out megaloblasts are large cells with an increased nuclear cytoplasmic ratio. And that's because there's a DNA deficit. You don't have enough DNA to mature that nucleus. And so it doesn't condense. So it stays big. And as a matter of fact, if you're B12 or B9 deficient, it's not just your reticulocytes, your red cell precursors that will be megaloblastic. It will be every rapidly dividing cell in your body. So you could actually diagnose a megaloblastic anemia just by a biopsy of say the liver or the crypts of Leverkuhn or the uterine cervix because those are heavily dividing cells, constantly dividing. And if you were a pathologist, you'd look at them under a slide and they'd have very large nuclei relative to their cytoplasm. So it could be dysplastic change, but then also if it's everywhere you look, well, maybe it's a megaloblastic anemia, megaloblastosis, that enlarged nucleus due to this vitamin deficiency. And again, impairment of DNA synthesis, specifically that deoxythymidine monophosphate enzymes thymidylate synthase. Let's talk about B12 more specifically now. B12 is cobalamin. It's got a cobalt atom as a cofactor actually inside the structure of the vitamin. B12 is only in animal products. So vegans, who do not eat meat or eggs or dairy are prone to develop B12 deficiency. The most common cause of B12 deficiency is a condition called pernicious anemia, which is an autoimmunity against intrinsic factor, but also against the cell surface of parietal cells. And parietal cells, recall, are those cells in your stomach which pump out acid and they also synthesize intrinsic factor, which is a protein that binds to B12 and chaperones it to the terminal ileum where B12 is absorbed into the body. Let's take a look at B12 absorption because 
there's one additional guy you need to know about in this process besides intrinsic factor. So here we see intrinsic factor produced by parietal cells of the stomach, the same ones that make hydrochloric gastric acid, and intrinsic factor will bind to B12 in the proximal duodenum and complex with it. But before B12 gets down there, when B12 gets in the mouth, in fact, you're producing this protein in your salivary glands and this soluble proteins in your saliva at all times, and it's called haptocorin. And another name for haptocorin is R factor. So R factor is the same as intrinsic factor, works the same way. It chaperones B12 from one place to another. So you need it to protect B12 in the stomach. And then you need intrinsic factor, once you get in the small bowel, for B12 to have a key to the door of the body. So R factor takes it to the stomach and prevents B12 from getting broken down by acids. And then intrinsic factor takes the job over, says, good job, R factor. You've done your job here. I'm going to take B12. We're going to go to the terminal ileum where it gets absorbed. Recall, that's the same place that you reabsorb bile salts. So there's a particular pancreatic enzyme that is responsible for cutting off R factor from B12 so that intrinsic factor can bind. And in the setting of a chronic pancreatitis, most common cause alcoholism, you would be deficient in that enzyme that's responsible for clipping off R factor. Thus, that's an avenue for potential B12 malabsorption. So that's how B12 gets into the body. So we talked about the autoimmune pernicious anemia, and it's called pernicious, right? What does pernicious mean? It means like Dracula, you know, like Frankenstein, like the most villainous villain you can think about. It's a really bad dude. And it doesn't go away, even though you're treating it. That's why it's pernicious, because you're treating these patients anemia, and then it comes back. And then you treat it some more, and then it just comes right back. And it doesn't go away because it's an autoimmunity. Pancreatic insufficiency talked about that directly related to that R protein, R factor. Small bowel problems, Crohn's disease absolutely can mess up your terminal ileum. That's the first place that gets hit in Crohn's disease in the Crohn's disease in the small bowel. Celiac sprue, gastric bypass. So Anytime you bypass the small bowel, you're at risk for a lot of vitamin deficiencies, but the ileum right there, B12 and bile salts. Other causes of B12 deficiency, diphilobothrium latum, which is a tapeworm that lives in fish. And in America, the fish of the Great Lakes uh, in the North Midwest, those are loaded relatively with diphilobothrium latum. So that's going to present with an eosinophilia and a vitamin B12 megaloblastic anemia. Again, it's a fish tapeworm. Finally, any cell cycle drug that disrupts the B9-B12 interaction can put you into a B9 or B12 deficient anemia and can cause megaloblastosis. So things like 6-mercaptopurine, something like 5-fluorouracil. We can treat many different cancers with those, but these drugs, again, block recycling of folate. So if you take folate out of the picture, well, you can't replenish B12. So if you have a folate deficiency, you're going to get symptoms of a B12 deficiency. You can't use the thing at all because it's going to be stuck 
unmethylated as just plain B12. And it needs that methyl group to do its job. So if you shut down the folate cycle because you're giving a drug like methotrexate or 5-fluorouracil, then you also shut down B12 and everything that it's trying to do with methionine over here as well. And to conclude that discussion from first aid, here's showing you 5-fluorouracil inhibitor of thymidylate synthase. Therefore, that's what we we're going to call the methyl trap. Every, every THF tetrahydrofolate that you got is going to get stuck with methyl groups on it. If you shut down thymidylate synthesis, it's not going to be able to get that methyl group off of it. So that's bad because, again, that leads to B12 deficiency. And then methotrexate shuts down DHFR dihydrofolate reductase oil rig reduction is gain of electrons and so that's why you go from two protons to four protons there so if you don't have dihydrofolate reductase you don't replenish tetrahydrofolate and you're stuck with unusable b12 now let's discuss folate Take a closer look at that. Folate is found in leafy greens, spinach, broccoli, kale, chard. So it's possible to get a dietary folate deficiency. And it's more common to get a folate deficiency than a B12 cobalamin deficiency. And that's because there's a lot of B12 stored up in the body. In fact, your liver contains enough B12 to power you for a good three or four or five years down the line. If you stopped eating B12 today, you'd have enough B12 for a long time. But folate is not stored as such and has a little bit shorter shelf life in the body. So folate deficiency just presents much sooner than a B12 deficiency. Now, there are such times where you need a lot of folate because you are synthesizing a lot of DNA. Anytime there's a high degree of mitosis going on systemically, you need some folate because you're going to be using it quicker. So that can create a deficiency just because of the increased demand. So examples are going to be pregnancy, right? You've got a fetus. That thing's got to grow. Need some DNA to do that. Need some folate to do that DNA. Kids in certain times of their life when they're hitting growth spurts. And hemolytic anemias, there we go. If you've got something that's just crushing up all the red cells in circulation, you've got a lot of erythropoietin, which is going to be driving a lot of DNA synthesis, which you were going to throw some folate at. And so if you have a hemolytic anemia that can deplete your B9 and give you a little extra red cell problem on top of whatever is causing the hemolysis. Again, intestinal disorders, albeit with a slight difference in localization compared to B12, whereas cobalamin is absorbed again in the terminal ileum along with bile salts. Folate, like most your B vitamins, is absorbed in the jejunum. So pathogenesis, folates in green leafy vegetables. Methyl tetrahydrofolate is the biologically active form. And If you can't use methyl tetrahydrofolate, you can't make DNA. Talking about graphic we hit earlier, talking about homocysteine, hit that earlier. Again, homocysteine is up in B9 and B12 deficiency. So you see it elevated. That's what you're dealing with. Although there is a connective tissue disorder that will lead to elevated homocysteine. I'm thinking Marfan's for some reason. Or maybe it's uh, homocysteine urea that has a Marfanoid habitus. I believe that's it. B12, big paragraph here, bottom of page six talking about how you have a lot of B12 in the body, so it takes a long time to get deficient. Talking about our protein, again, haptocorin, produced by your salivary glands, just chaperones B12 to the small bowel. 
and you need a pancreatic enzyme to cut it off. Intrinsic factor is produced by parietal cells, which themselves are found in the fundus of the stomach. That's the body of it. And the cardia, that's kind of the top of the stomach. And so that localization is your differential for autoimmune versus helicobacter-based gastritis. Helicobacter pylori, obviously by its name, is going to affect the pylorus and the antrum of the stomach predominantly, whereas autoimmune gastritis likes to tear up that body that's a little higher up than the pylorus. So you got two different forms of B12. That's where the SDL goes next. You've got adenosylcobalamin and methylcobalamin. And what you want to take away from this is that B12 does two really important things in the body. Number one, it allows DNA synthesis by regenerating folate, tetrahydrofolate. And then number two, it contributes to odd chain fatty acid metabolism. And that's what adenosylcobalamin does. And that adenosylcobalamin, when you're deficient in that form of B12, that specifically is what contributes to the elevated methylmalonic acid in the blood whenever you're B12 deficient. The enzyme's methylmalonyl CoA mutase. And again, that's going to eventually make succinyl CoA that feeds into the citric acid cycle. If that's blocked, propionyl CoA, three carbons in a CoA, just builds up intracellularly. And the first cell that sees the effects of that is going to be the myelinating cell of the nervous system, leading to demyelination, leading to your subacute combined degeneration. Symptoms. So megaloblastic anemia is common to both vitamin deficiencies. Folate deficiency is a more acute onset B12 deficiency, more insidious. Only B12 deficiency produces neurologic changes due to posterolateral column demyelination. And again, that demyelination is because propionyl CoA which becomes propionic acid. And same thing as a lactic acidosis, you know, cells don't like that. Enzymes denature at a lower pH. They kind of starve themselves for oxygen and that's toxic to myelinating cells. So based on the pathways impacted, you get paresthesias due to your dorsal column involvement. You get loss of proprioception. So the foot exam is important here, you know? Uh, hand exam. You can tell that with fingertips too. Vibratory sensation. How do you assess that? Get your tuning fork, give it a whack, put it on their malleolus or something like that, or on their big toes, see if they can feel it. And then Romberg sign. If the patient comes in and you notice an ataxia, you're going to want to do a Romberg sign to say, is this a spinal cord problem or a cellabellar problem? So let's break this down. What's Romberg's test? Well, you have the patient stand up, right? And so you have them just stand up and they're normal, they're standing here. And then you have them close their eyes and you wait a minute. And if they start to fall forward or fall to the side in one direction, you know, they can't keep their balance. So that's a positive Romberg sign. Patient just can't stand with their eyes closed. They need their eyes because they don't have any peripheral proprioception because there's a spinal demyelination going on with their dorsal columns. So that's what a positive Romberg sign tells you. Now, if a patient's got a cerebellar ataxia, all right, check this out. Then what that means is that they don't even have to close their eyes. You just tell them to stand up and look at you and they're just going to be like fall into one side, you know, because that's, that's such a, that's a heavier problem that uh, is going to present Again, with the eyes open, it's like, geez, you don't have a cerebellum. So that's Romberg's sign. And that's why patients with the cerebellum ataxia don't have a positive Romberg sign because they can't even take the test, right? Like they're, they're going to have ataxia with their eyes open even. And so it's like, don't even bother with that. And again, demyelinating a lot of different columns. One of those is your lateral corticospinal tract. Let's take a look at it here. Got it outlined in yellow on both sides. And that's a corticospinal tract. So it goes from your motor cortex to your muscles. 
And if that's out, that's an upper motor neuron lesion. So you're going to, patient's going to present with upper motor neuron signs and symptoms, such as a spastic paralysis rather than a flaccid, that'd be a lower motor neuron problem, right? And then maybe they would have a Babinski sign, which is when you go tickle their foot and it splays and it's like upper motor neuron problem. Okay. So remember upper versus lower motor neuron, real easy to remember. If you have an upper motor neuron problem, the tone of the muscle is up. It wants to stay contracted. It wants to stay clenched. And so that's your spastic paralysis as well as a hyperreflexia. It's, uh, it's threshold for excitation. It's very excited. Everything's up in an upper motor neuron problem versus a lower motor neuron problem. Everything is down. You can't get the muscle to do anything. It's a flaccid paralysis with a hyporeflexia. Then we talk about laboratory studies. Working up a macrocytic anemia, obviously you need a blood count to tell you the patient's got a low hemoglobin. You need a mean corpuscular volume that's going to give you the degree or the size of the anemia rather. And then once you figure out it's macrocytic, you probably want to get an iron just in case because a lot of people are iron deficient. Let's see if that's confounding anything. And you want to get a serum B9 and B12. That's going to be the easiest test these days is just go ahead and get the vitamins themselves because these are by far the most common causes of macrocytic anemias. Now, the RET count is going to be normal or low reflecting an inappropriate marrow response. Well, the patient can't make DNA. They don't have B9, they don't have B12. Either or, you can't make DTMP. You're not making your Ts for your DNA. That's like a quarter of your DNA. You need that. So that's why the ret count is low. You're just not, you're trying to make those cells, but you can't. So you're gonna have hyperplasia in the bone marrow, but with an inability to mature those cells. Peripheral blood shows macro ovalocytes, and that's not as important diagnostically as the hypersegmented neutrophils. Now, a bone marrow biopsy is the definitive diagnosis for a megaloblastic anemia. You want to get in there and see, is there red cell hyperplasia? Is there megaloblastosis? megalocytosis, megalosomething, you know, is there, are, are there big nuclei compared to the cytoplasms? And so if you go and look into the bone marrow, well, another reason why there's hyperplasia is because these cells are big. So if a cell's in the bone marrow and it's really, really big, it's got to get out of the bone marrow somehow. So when a big cell tries to get out of the bone marrow, it's like, yo mama so fat she couldn't fit through the door. It's like this cell is trying to get out of the bone marrow and it just can't. It's too big. So it gets stuck. And so the cells behind it get stuck and it starts looking like, you know, the interstate. And uh, so there's a backup of cells that adds to the hyperplasia of the bone marrow. And that's really big and that's what can cause a pancytopenia in bad cases of megaloblastic anemia is all your blood cell types, whites and reds and platelets too, are going to get stuck in the bone marrow because these big fat red cells are taking up room around there and crowding them out, make it harder to get to the front of the line out that bone marrow. And so all cell lineages are going to be down when cells start getting stuck in the marrow because of this size problem. Now, serum assays, you want to get a homocysteine and a methylmalonic acid homocysteine is up in both B9 and B12. Methylmalonic acid is only up in B12 deficiency. The Schilling test is not used that often nowadays. How you do it, it's a test for B12 deficiency. So you give the patient B12. First, you measure urinary B12 and you see if there's any in the urine. And if there's not, well, then they don't have any. So you give them some B12 and you see if they pee it out. And then if they pee it out, then 
you know that they were B12 deficient and you just fixed it. And if they don't pee it out, what you know is that, well, maybe the B12 didn't get absorbed by the body. So you could go hunting for a cause of B12 malabsorption, for example, uh, pernicious anemia, pancreatitis, uh, chronic, uh, diphthalobothrum laudum, small bowel problems. So that's what's going to, if you give them B12 and they don't pee it out, you know it didn't get into the body. So that's the shilling test. And finally, individuals with pernicious anemia have achlorhydria eventually because remember, there's an antibody against parietal cells. And if you take out all the parietal cells of the stomach, you just won't make gastric acid. That's achlorhydria compared to hypochlorhydria, which is just a slight deficiency of it. And that comes up in question stems differentiating pernicious anemia from helicobacter gastritis. As does, again, gastric body and fundus compared to the pylorus, which is affected in helicobacter. Spinal cord abnormalities, one more time. You get spinal cord problems and a B12 deficiency because you need B12 to break down odd chain fatty acids and put them into the TCA cycle at succinyl CoA taken from propionyl-CoA to methylmalonyl-CoA to succinyl-CoA. You don't have B12, you get a buildup of methylmalonyl-CoA and propionyl-CoA, and that three carbons plus CoA is toxic to myelinating cells of the nervous system, so those cells die. And when they die, you get demyelination. And when you get demyelination, you start getting subacute combined degeneration, which is going to be your loss of peripheral proprioception vibration, some hyper- reflexive hypertonic upper motor neuron signs too because of the lateral column involvement. Now let's discuss, well, quickly, treatment, treatment, right? So what do you do? Correct the deficiency. You know they're deficient in something. You got to give them something. But if it keeps going back, they keep getting symptoms, work up further for causes of B12 malabsorption. Just named a lot of that stuff. And also, the drugs that they're on, if you just take them off that drug, oftentimes that's all that it'll take to just correct that anemia with the standard diet. Non-megaloblastic macrocytic anemia. A handful of causes of this, definitely less common than megaloblastic. So probably the most common non-megaloblastic macrocytosis is going to be alcohol. And this has to do with how alcohol plays with your blood lipids, because alcohol is a membrane destabilizer. It destabilizes the mitochondrial membrane. And it also has metabolic effects where it forces you into lipid synthesis, right? Because of the excess NADH, you think you're full all the time. And so you go into anabolic processes whenever you drink. And so you're making lipids. So this is going to increase the cholesterol content of all cells in your body, if you are a chronic alcoholic, they're going to get accustomed to having more lipids around. So they'll put more cholesterol into their membranes just because it's there and they have to do something with it. So when red blood cells have more cholesterol and more membrane, period, they're bigger, hence the macrocytosis. There's nothing else really wrong with the red blood cell in that scenario other than it's just really big. So this can cause something like a hemolysis when it gets around to the spleen and maybe it can't fit through the cords of Bill Roth. And so you may be able to diagnose this uh, based off of Billy Rubin. But that's the gist of what's going on. It's a lipid problem. Alcohol changes your lipid profile and that's reflected in the cell membranes of not just all cells in your body, but particularly red cells. They're nothing but membrane. Hypothyroidism, another cause of macrocytic anemia. So when you're doing your initial workup, if you can afford it, go ahead and get that TSH. That's the one test we want to do. And then if that's out of whack, you can get a T4 as well. But remember, if you got one test to get that TSH is going to tell you everything you need to know about is there a thyroid problem or not. Reticulocytosis, our reticulocytes a little bit bigger than an erythrocyte. And here's the visual comparison obviously getting smaller as these cells age and condense. And so that reticulocyte, what could give you a reticulocytosis? Peripheral hemolytic anemia, 
uh, a high degree of erythropoietin uh, reflects a need for red blood cells. So maybe some altitude is going to do that or some kidney failure or stenosis of a renal artery you could get your reticulocyte count elevated. Post hemorrhagic as well, you need the blood. There's your hypoxia, your kidneys uh, react accordingly by making EPO. Myelodysplastic syndrome can give you a macrocytic anemia. Myelodysplastic, anytime you see the word myelo, we're thinking marrow, bone marrow, and dysplastic, what does that mean? It means the marrow doesn't grow right. So bone marrow doesn't grow right. That's what myelodysplastic means. Now, if it's a syndrome, that means it's all over your body, not just one little part of one little bone. So you're going to see hypercellular marrow in a myelodysplastic syndrome with trilineage dysplastic changes. And when we say trilineage, uh, that generally means red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. And so all three of those components are going to be down or uh, somewhat abnormal if you do a smear, if you especially do a bone marrow biopsy. And then drugs. Um, the drug-related macrocytosis, again, any cell cycle drug that plays with the production of DTMP through thymidylate synthase and the regeneration of folate can give you a macrocytic anemia and eventually a vitamin deficiency, but the macrocytosis is going to precede the vitamin deficiency. That's all that this little section of the paper is saying. So that's our megaloblastic anemias. Again, megaloblastosis, large nuclear cytoplasm, ratio. Why? Because there's a difficulty making DNA. See you next time.